Alliance is the Disaster Recovery Innovations in Longmont, Colorado, and our presenter is Peter Gibbons. My name is Michael Gumpert. I work for FEMA Community Planning and Capacity Building. Thank you, Peter, for uh, offering your your perspectives and insights, and uh, take it away. Just uh, tell you a little bit about Longmont. So the city of Longmont is a a uh, relatively small town uh, north of the city of Boulder and south of the city of Fort Collins. We are right at the base of the Front Range uh, mountain range in Colorado. Uh, we basically, one of the things that most people will probably know us for is the fact that we have got a direct view of Long Peak, uh, which is one of the tallest and uh, more, or well, it's one of the, it's, it's a very tall 14er and it is probably one of the more dangerous ones to hike, um, but also very popular. Um, I've been the flood recovery manager for the city since 2016. Um, I was hired three years after we had a series of, well, we had a, a big set of flooding in 2013, but I was hired in 2016 to come and help uh, manage that disaster recovery. So the 2013 floods in Longmont, um, really on the grand scheme of what FEMA handles, I would call this relatively a relatively small event, um, but we had about $150 million worth of damage to city infrastructure. Uh, and over $55 million worth of FEMA-funded recovery projects ended up coming in as a result of it and the lesser-known 2015 floods. Um, we lost bridges, roads, trails, communication, water storage, other infrastructure. It was uh, one of the biggest events that we've had in uh, recent history, um, which FEMA's been tremendously helpful with uh, repairing and helping us recovery. So one of the ways that we ended up getting a really uh, good recovery going was actually we, we, we really kind of got lucky in some ways. We had <clears throat> really the right people um, in the right place at the right time. Uh, we had people in, in key positions that have had uh, experience in other communities with disaster recovery. Um, and one thing that I've learned while studying this is that our outcomes were not yet really institutionalized by policies and plans. Um, we have continued to actually carry changes into our city system based on lessons learned during the 2013 flood event uh, that, have, that, that we hope will help us in the future by institutionalizing this. But we really got very lucky in having some extremely committed, dedicated, forward-thinking um, people in our midst, um, and it's really made for a positive recovery for our community. So when we kind of outline the way our disaster recovery was outlined from the beginning, we centered our recovery and actually formed a steering committee among our leadership across all city departments that focused on community, fiscal, and infrastructure components. This has been one of the most important things that we've continued to communicate to other uh, organizations going through uh, a, a disaster event, that these are really the main things you have to focus on as a municipal or even state entity. Um, everything has to come, everything boils down to community, fiscal, and infrastructure. Um, one of the unique things that we ended up doing, uh, and this kind of comes from one of my primary interests in adding uh, value and efficiency to processes in kind of the government sphere, um, we applied lean methodology to our recovery process, which is everything from our RFR process to our closeout uh, to data storage and directory structure. So for those not familiar with Lean, Lean is um, a descendant of Six Sigma. Uh, it's, you know, a very common process management um, method. Uh, what Lean also is, is it's descended from Toyota's Kaizen system. So we've got Six Sigma, Kaizen. Um, the city and county of Denver ended up adapting this for local government use. And why that's helpful is that it's very, very approachable uh, for working on, you know, government-oriented processes. So one of the underlying books, it's actually very easy to read. This is a very fast read for uh, most people, is this peak performance book. It was actually written by Brian Elms, who was the, he's the prior director of Denver Peak Academy through the city and county of Denver. So it's kind of odd to see a book that actually came out of a municipal entity, but this book was written, written by that director um, while he was uh, serving the city and county of Denver. So I definitely recommend this book to anyone looking uh, into how to create um, 
how to apply lean in a government sphere, uh, and I found it extremely useful for crafting my processes at the city for disaster recovery. So one of the main things that we use, this is a living example of how I applied lean to our disaster recovery processes. I created a workflow board to help focus the team that was working on this. Um, what you're seeing on the on the screen right now is basically this large board that I printed out on a plotter, so I made that board in Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, what it helped me do was gain focus for a team that in the beginning was struggling very hard with trying to figure out what the workflow was, where they were, um, where they were going, and what needed to happen. So the little sticky notes are actually PW numbers. Uh, so this photo was actually taken relatively early on in our closeout process, which we are now on the bleeding edge of. So we are now only closing out projects that are still under, or that have only recently finished construction. So we're doing quite well on our closeout process. But the main takeaway from this is that it was very important for my team, given the complexity of these projects and closeouts, to create a visual workflow so that everybody knew where we were, what we were working on, so that we could um, gain focus and clarity on what our process was. Um, what each of these sticky notes link to is a Trello board. So I don't know if everyone on the line uh, has used or seen Trello before, but um, Trello allows for the creation of interactive checklists and um, what we ended up doing was making it so that this board that you're seeing on the screen uh, shows the major projects that are in work, but then that links to the Trello board um, and it's all kind of part of our visual workflow here. So. Uh, here's, a, here's an image of that Trello board, um, and you'll notice some familiar terminologies here. The 4229 is the, declared de uh, the declaration number, and then there's the PW numbers. So I had my team, I created a, uh, a template with my team uh, after designing what the phases or closeout are, and we use Lean to design those phases. So every phase creates something that the next phase needs in order to succeed. Uh, so each of these cards has checklists uh, within them, and they're not just checklists of do this, do that, or that you've done this or done that. Uh, these checklists are actually instructional. So uh, they, they tell, if you're, if you're not sure you're doing it for the first time, it helps you figure out you know, what needs to be done, not just that it needs to be done, if that makes sense. And the lovely thing about Trello is that the boards are free and it's super intuitive. Uh, as to how to use this to make uh, to make these checklists happen. Uh, the other major thing that we did uh, was to develop a dashboard for our, our intranet. So that is the website that's available only to city staff within our network. Um, what I realized was that when I started, the city didn't really have a good sense, the city and staff didn't have a sense for where they were in the recovery and where they needed to go. So I created a dashboard with my team to not only help guide my team to make sure they knew where they were standing, but also to help leadership know where we were in the grander scheme of our disaster recovery. Um, I can't emphasize the importance of this uh, enough because this has been one of the things that has helped ease the tension, get people to draw down on their anxiety about disaster recovery and kind of the unknown aspect of disaster recovery. So, uh, this is this has been very useful. It's also on a content management system, so it's very easy to update. Um, I've had admin assistants updating the information, even though we've had accountants, you know, vetting the numbers that we actually post here. So this has been very helpful for indicating where we are. Another major thing that we did here in Longmont was uh, I started visualizing a lot of our uh, processes. Uh, that pertain to like how to process labor data, how to understand labor data, uh, how to do RFRs and so on. Um, what I realized was that one of the natural tendencies of, of most staff is to generate lengthy narratives and actually create complexity because that's what, um, I mean, that's kind of our, kind of a native thing to want to do or it's really kind of the easier path to make something complicated. Um, but what I wanted to do was make it simple. So I started creating what I called kind of one-page training documents. And what you're seeing on the page, I don't expect you to be able to read this because it's, you know, it's very pixelated. Um, but what this generally shows is how and where 
uh, labor data processing happens. So what the source data is, what happens to it to make it final and official, um, and then where it goes, where it goes in the end. So this is kind of the one page document that I would give to someone new, which we've done, and it has led to basically seamless handoffs uh, between staff moving on to other positions, other organizations, um, but also being able to um, remove, you know, what we all call silos, right? Because I I brought the processes out into the open for everyone. So this was a result of a lean process where I worked with my team to map out exactly how labor data um, processing happened, and then I transcribed all that all of that kind of process map information into a more simple one-page document for training, um, and it ended up being tremendously helpful uh, for us. So before the call, Michael and I were talking about uh, GIS and what the city did with GIS in the beginning, which I, I, I was super impressed by uh, the fact that our leadership jumped in and was talking about GIS as one of the first things that they used. Um, what I discovered when I started at the city was that we had also dropped some of that uh, emphasis because I don't think everyone realized just how useful that would be for actually carrying the longer term goal of this particular recovery. Um, so I ended up actually publishing a poster at the National uh, the Natural Hazards Workshop in Broomfield uh, a couple years ago based on what we did with our GIS. So we ended up integrating the longer term recovery information with GIS by setting project area extents. Um, and then we actually tied, um, we integrated more of that kind of meta information into those project areas. So. Uh, we're actually interlinking our long-term digital archive with those project areas. We even have them tagged with, you know, that they are actually FEMA, you know, these are FEMA-funded projects. Um, and then down at the bottom for those at the workshop who didn't have, you know, necessarily direct disaster experience, which would be kind of rare at that particular workshop. But I kind of outlined what, why we were doing this, what the long game was that we were trying to do. Um, and I'm happy to send this to anybody, this is something I like to share just so that people can kind of see it. Um, it was really built for a non-FEMA audience, but um, I think you guys might find it entertaining at the very least. So the, the most important takeaways, I actually copied these straight from the poster, um, but we mapped all 42 of our FEMA PWs, um, including the version histories, so you can see how many versions we have. Um, we defined 17 layers, which um, I can I can find that information out, but um, I don't I don't have it on me right at this moment. You wouldn't want to hear me listing off layer attributes right now, anyway. Uh, we mapped mostly the spatial, temporal, legal, and financial details of the PWs. So we actually have a very rich um, GIS understanding of our disaster, which I think is a pretty cool thing to be able to uh, talk about and show people. Um, I think most of the general takeaways here is that we, we we did this GIS work in the beginning, which is amazing, and then um, it kind of fell by the wayside, and then we ended up boosting it up to the point that it is now going to be the go-to thing for our longer-term recovery so that auditors can get a very, very clear view of exactly what we did. Um, one of our main points here was to create um, transparency and accountability and also make sure that any project managers doing work on the ground within certain periods uh, would know that they were dealing with FEMA funded infrastructure so that they could talk to us before they went ahead and did work so that we could not only protect the city but protect FEMA from even having to deal with the level of information of you know what did you do after you you know we paid for your infrastructure and so on. Um, final note is that there's also a web map uh, made for every city staff uh, so they can access the ArcGIS online. Uh, through our website and explore disaster recovery that way. So that's a really neat way to broadcast the details as well. Um, another major thing we did was to templatize pretty much everything. Uh, my goal was to create consistency in how we were communicating. Um, also make sure that we were controlling the level of details to be prudent in the way we were uh, designing information for presentation to FEMA. One thing I realized was that FEMA is going through a disaster, they're helping us, it's the center of our entire world, but then FEMA moves on to another disaster and then another one and another one. So 
what I realized was that we needed to find a way to create concise, accurate, true information to present to the people who are supporting our recovery. So one of the ways we did that was we kind of went into a constant improvement cycle on all of our documentation. Uh, I made sure that my entire staff was empowered to make changes, propose changes, make new templates, um, and integrate lessons learned on a regular basis. What we've come out with is a very consistent way to communicate, a very, a very clear writing style that we hope is helpful to all those reviewers. Um, our entire intent here was to make all of this stuff standardized work. Um, another thing we did was to completely change the way we were writing scope change proposals. So um, one thing I've noticed is I've also helped other communities in the area with their recoveries is that one of the natural tendencies is to write very lengthy narratives that include very complex um, levels of detail embedded in the text. So what I started getting uh, my staff and other staff to do was to um, only put a narrative which you absolutely needed to, but then anytime there is going to be quantity or dollar level data, um, you pull it out into tables or you refer to the document that actually has that and make it very clear as to what that document is and why you would need to look at it. Um, this is something we've improved over time, so our closeouts that FEMA is currently reviewing are the earliest iterations of a process that we're now using that we, I think, is now better than it's ever been. So our most recent closeouts will be the cleanest uh, that you've ever seen, I hope. That's at least the intent. Uh, let's see, what else here? Um, I know this is an odd point. It's something that a lot of people probably don't, don't think of in the beginning, but when I came into the city, one thing that I noticed was that we had a bunch of directories in our shared drives, which is where we put all this information. Uh, they, a lot of the directories were named by the staff that were here. So when I started, there was, you know, the name, a directory named with our old natural resources director and then our accountant and the accountant before them. And the, the directory structure looked to me like a graveyard, um, you know, of staff that have come and gone. And it didn't make any sense to me to have to go into the, let's say the Johnson directory to get an accounting template. So what I did was I restructured, and this, this was a pretty big effort uh, to come in partway through and restructure, but I restructured our data so that it was in the shape of the disaster recovery itself um, and the recovery documentation so that as my staff is going through and processing this paperwork, our directory structure is built in such a way that people can drop the, the documentation into its, its matching folder and then it can just stay there. It doesn't have to get renamed and, and all this stuff. It, it, it just stays there until it's ready to be submitted in our bar. This strangely ended up adding um, a tremendous amount of simplicity and clarity to our process so that we could continue doing good work on the rest of the recovery. So the short takeaway here is that I kind of approached our disaster recovery as a data management process, not so much as a, you know, complex operation of, you know, the difficulty levels that some people were wanting to put into it. I just figured, let's just make this part um, as easy as can be. So this is another example where Lean was helpful. And um, I think this is, this is one thing I would pass along. It also made it so that our, uh, if we had another disaster tomorrow, so let's say we got, you know, declaration 5449, we would just clone our directory structure template and just start plugging away at a new disaster. And we would probably be closing out projects in that 90 day period. We wouldn't have to be doing the go back in time thing that we, we did right in the beginning. So another thing that I did was I created a manual. So my team had uh, in the beginning had attempted to create uh, SOPs, which is a, a lovely acronym um, and great in theory. But what I realized is that we needed something that was living that allowed us to change because every time a computer system changes um, or a process or a person, um, you end up with the documentation that falls so far out of date that it would be useful, useless to hand off. So documentation became a regular part of my team's work. And this is an example of where we put it. I actually ended up using uh, Microsoft OneNote. Um, I even outlined in these trainings like tools and skills needed so that anyone in the future, like if I win the lottery <laughs> and end up not working here anymore, will someone be able to figure out kind of like 
what kind of staff, what kind of skill level would you need to give this process to? And this is how we did it, uh, was through tools that we had at hand um, and available to us as part of our computer installations anyway. So rather than going through uh, more of the nitty gritty, there's so many of those that I can walk through. Um, but some of our major innovations were kind of in the human and management uh, realm. Uh, one of the major things that I did was uh, I installed what I call training moments into our staff meetings. So I made training a regular part of our team meetings to make sure that everyone was able to display their knowledge on a regular basis and so that all staff were aware of what someone else was doing. Um, this really came from the fact that when I started, there were silos um, in in my team. I mean, I started, I, I walked into a team that was established or there were five people on the team, not including the manager. And uh, there was infighting and what have you. Our, our recovery was not always perfect, and I'm, I wouldn't even venture to say that it is now, but we, we now have a very collaborative environment, whereas the past was not necessarily that. Um, so what I ended up doing was breaking some of that down by uh, making training a regular part of our work, um, making collaboration a main part of our work, and part of the culture, and so I, I really ended up having to work on the human dimensions of uh, managing that team and staff rather than just the technicals and the nitty gritty and the rules and everything. There was, there was definitely an ecology that needed to be supported among the staff, and that's what, I, that's what all of the prior innovations that I showed you were intended to do, was to create that bridge between the Disaster, the disaster details, the technological systems that were involved, and the people that were involved. Um, and we ended up coming out very successfully. We've had some moments of just amazing, you know, innovation, success with our recovery. Um, but another thing I did here was to create lead and backup schedules. So rather than just having one person in charge of, you know, this particular dimension or this thing, um, I made sure that everything we did had a first person and a second person. Uh, and that way, that opened up the door to training each person. Uh, I cannot recommend the uh, value of creating a lead and a backup schedule um, for staff more. Like this is this is such a huge thing because it it immediately starts to break down uh, silos among staff. Um, I also created work sessions for teams, the team to get together. Sometimes I would bring snacks and food, you know, to make these things kind of fun. Uh, but the intent of these was to get people working together rather than, you know, rampant, you know, regular phone calls. So everybody kind of plans these out first, and then we choose to have them or not. So if there's nothing that we can do together, then we just don't have them. But um, most oftentimes there is something that we can do. Um, I think that's basically the, that's the bulk of the presentation. So um, let's talk about the hiring decisions first. So one of the things that the city did that was, uh, quite unique was that rather than hiring the consultants, because you know the consultants can do a great job, but they can also be very expensive. Um, Longmont ended up putting together a team of people, um, starting from the disaster, to start working on the different components. Uh, strangely, those people ended up actually working under our Office of Emergency Management, which at the time did not have a recovery component built in. So the city's main philosophy on this was. Um, not only that they didn't necessarily want to or could afford a consultant given the longevity of, like, given the, the damage that they were seeing, uh, the city also made specific decisions to invest in staff rather than invest in the um, consultants because they knew that they could hire staff that they could keep on for longer, which was the most important thing. Even today, we kind of are trying to figure out how do we get our staff, you know, to stay, or like how do we keep staffing levels high through 2022 when we anticipate our final project officially closing, um, which is a, you know, that's a pretty long game for, for recovery. But um, one of the main benefits that it's really added is also kind of that in, that internal accountability so people aren't getting pulled out and put in kind of, you know, randomly like you might see with a consulting firm. Like we saw that with the state of Colorado. Um, they hired, I believe it was uh, Deloitte, 
And our, one of our biggest challenges was that we were getting advice from uh, consultants uh, with the state on our PA projects who would then get whisked off to another project relatively quickly, and then we would find that maybe that advice wasn't all that valuable. So, um, yeah, so the city ended up hiring a team. That team ended up serving the recovery super well. I'm, you know, I became the manager of that team in 2016. Um, my hire was actually one of the most, uh, well, I humbly say that it was odd, but I guess hindsight, maybe it wasn't all that odd. Um, when I was hired, uh, I went up against someone who was actually a, a FEMA veteran, uh, which seemed like a much better fit to me. Like when I, as soon as I learned that, I was like, oh, there's no way I got this job and so on. Um, but when I talked to my, uh, when I talked to Harold about, you know, why, why did they pick me out of the mix? Um, I, first of all, had luckily just finished a kind of non-traditional graduate degree where I actually studied disaster and wrote my master's thesis on the 2013 flood. Uh, so that was super helpful. Uh, so I was also super interested in disaster. Um, but they also told me that one of the reasons that they, that they ended up hiring me was that uh, every disaster is different. And they needed someone who was a researcher rather than a veteran of the old system. Uh, so that was a really interesting thought to me because some, some would tend to go with, well, let's hire the person with the most experience um, that, that you know, knows these systems. But the recognition that every disaster is different, that the restructuring of FEMA policy structures is a critical piece um, was interesting. So that led me into a fever of having to research, how does this actually work? What, what are people saying about this process and so on? And what I ended up coming up with was, uh, has been successful so far, but it's also led to a greater understanding of the rule set as it is today, but also kind of an innate and intuitive sense that with any future disaster, we will basically relearn the system and it will just be part of our process rather than um, rather than being a surprise or you know necessarily having to rehire because we don't understand the rule set. I know that if we have another disaster that we will immediately go into a policy review um, and we will be listening very closely to what FEMA is telling us during a disaster uh, to get that done. Does that answer your question, Mike? Is that a good overview yeah. of our hiring yeah. decisions? Yeah, so you're reminding me of your other point that um, I think we had talked about, which was kind of how we approach FEMA. So when I walked in the door, frustrations were relatively high. So um, I think everyone on the call is probably aware that the FEMA policy set can be very difficult for some organizations uh, to work with. Um, really, the city of Longmont a few years ago was not much different. We were seeing uh, large scope change proposals get rejected not really a lot of understanding for why they were getting rejected and so on. Um, so really, I think one of the biggest differences that I was able to make in this organization relatively early on was to say, I think everyone should just pause and I think we need to study what, like what, what policies we're dealing with here, how strict they are. We need to talk to FEMA about like what's the best approach. So I think one of the biggest innovations that I did, which I didn't list in the presentation because I, I I didn't really count it as an innovation. To me, it's just kind of an intuitive mode of operation. But uh, I started broadcasting the need to study and learn and recraft our approaches rather than standing and fighting something that didn't totally make sense. Um, so one place that I got that is that I started using the FEMA 322 guide as, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to go too far in this, but you know, basically as a Bible, <laughs> you know, like we really started looking into the words, what they meant. Um, I also started looking into the, um, I can't remember what the first part of it is. I just refer to it as the 9,500, um, but it's basically the deeper rule set that kind of frames things. So I, I sometimes say that rather than going to war with FEMA, one of the first things that I did was actually go to war with my own organization. Um, but I did it in a very, um, with my team's help, with a very positive approach so that we were very focused on making sure that whatever we were doing, it was not only FEMA eligible, but that we were clearly and transparently communicating um, 
what we were doing here, why we were doing it, and that it was within the FEMA policy set. So um, some of our biggest projects, we ended up having to rescope um, early on. And when I got my hands on those proposals, one of the first things I started doing was talking to our engineering director and the consulting firm that was designing the project and started to actually craft those proposals with, well, how can we fit this rule set? You know, like, can you change this to do, to do that instead? Would this, would this harm your project? And they were like, oh, no, that would, you know, that would actually be possible. So um, I think just to boil this down into a more conceptual nugget, what we did was we, we decided to start um, studying the rule set first and building our projects with the intent of making them FEMA eligible, FEMA safe, rather than standing and fighting based on what we thought or what we wanted. Because the staff that were here during the disaster, they, I would, I would say that our general cultural mode was somewhat PTSD. Like everyone was in kind of a fight or flight mode and had never really drawn down from that. Um, so by kind of taking a step back, being able to take a deep breath and say, hey, you know, what if we what if we completely reach what if we completely change our philosophy and how we're approaching FEMA? What if we drop all of the, you know, um, the media portrayals and what have you? What if we just say, well, what are the rules first, and then we start doing the work? Um, and that really made a huge change in the way our disaster recovery went. Um, it also, um, I mean, Longmont luckily uh, had a very positive view from the beginning of FEMA and how FEMA works um, and what our, you know, how our recovery wasn't even possible without FEMA. So we, we ended up having a very different outlook than a lot of people from the start. We just amplified that once we discovered that, hey, we're not actually paying as close of attention to the rules as we need to. FEMA has a rule set and all their staff are doing is, is trying to, you know, make sure that that rule set is, is upheld throughout the process. So um, I think that was, that was a that was a major step forward for us was approaching FEMA as a positive partner and actually um, creating our proposals with the absolute intent of making them FEMA safe from the get go and FEMA readable from the get go. So not putting too much information in them. Yeah. So Matt T's question is, uh, how did you integrate management of other federal funding streams uh, such as when CDBG dollars came into play? Ah, uh, yes. So our community services department was really the front runner for the CDBG funds. Um, when I realized that there was a need for a much higher level of coordination between FEMA and CDBG uh, funding because of the incompatibilities that existed there, um, while our our prior mode and our engineering director, who is a who is just a juggernaut, he's a wizard of of what he does. Um, but his tendency was to want to put dollars really close to each other or um, overlay funding, meaning not duplication of benefit, but he wanted to use CDBG funds to buy this and use FEMA funds to buy that. What we ended up getting him to do, which ended up being a great innovation, um, was to create dirt maps, basically, and to actually craft project areas that kept these funds separate. Um, in some cases, we actually in zones where we couldn't get the federal um, uh, cost-benefit ratios, uh, you know, quite right, or we were like, well, this is, you know, just one difficult little sliver of the project, uh, we actually installed buffers of funding so that uh, the map looked more like a, um, like a uh, jigsaw puzzle than a, you know, than a, than a, than a mixed up, you know, thing. Like, the, the point of that was to make it so there were very clear lines for how that funding was uh, was not only drawn on land, but we also used those funding lines to bid out our projects via separate bid schedules. Um, and then we maintained those bid schedules throughout the construction process, uh, tracking for the levels of detail that both HUD and FEMA need for those dollar sources. So the main takeaway here is that we um, we just drew out on, on land where we would be putting certain dollars, and then we made sure that those were maintained through our bid schedules. 
and that our contractors doing the work on the ground were tracking the accurate level of detail or the necessary level of detail. Peter, did you, did oh. you mention earlier something called a, a dirt map? Yeah, so I see that uh, Mary Ann wrote, what is a dirt knot? Um, so K-N-O-T-T. -T. So I was actually saying dirt map, M-A-P. Um, we And what that means is uh, anywhere that we were doing any kind of work on the ground, um, we were drawing lines of where funding would go. So when I say dirt map, I mean just the Anywhere there was going to be a dollar put ended up being a square on the ground. Like it's just a, it's just a, you could call it a money map, a funding map, but it just made sure that there was no intermixing of uh, different federal funding sources, and it completely visualized our um, our recovery dollars and where they were going. Uh, prior to the flood, did uh, Longmont have a uh, comprehensive plan? or any pre-disaster plan, and then after the disaster, um, how was a vision assembled of how to go forward? Yeah, so our comp plan um, is called Envision Longmont, and that's been a document um, that we've been using for a lot of years. Uh, the comp plan, we, so the Longmont has been kind of odd in that we've always recognized that our little St. Rain Creek was uh, was a potential liability for disaster. We've seen it flood before. We've just never seen it flood the way it did in 2013. Um, so we have a disaster response plan, um, but we didn't, I'm, I'm not really sure that I would say we had a pre-disaster plan, um, but what's come out of this is um, a, we also now have a recovery plan. So the recovery plan is something that I've been drafting with the help of uh, one of our assistant city managers who was instrumental in helping our recovery get going, and then our operation and emergency manager. Um, so one of the things we did with the recovery plan uh, is also to not make it complicated. So plans are great, but when it comes down to an event, uh, the big long plans will end up being the dusty thing on the shelf that nobody really pulls out or that we can't totally understand. So. We have trimmed down our, uh, our recovery plan support directly with our emergency response plan uh, for these kinds of disasters. Uh, we are also building in resiliency, uh, and so resiliency is one of my kind of, I guess I would call it an academic interest. Um, so I've helped our community services, or I've participated with our community services in a variety of uh, resiliency um, work. So they created a resiliency framework um, and kind of a plan. Uh, these things have been adopted internally by the city. Uh, these things are all kind of working in symphony with each other. Um, one of the things that we've become very interested in lately, though, is also making sure that our recovery and response plans uh, have built in equity and sustainability. I know that's a whole lot of buzzwords that I just planned together. Um, but the efforts going on here are, are really positive to keep in mind because we want to make sure that in any future event we have equity, you know, built into those from the get-go so that we don't create, you know, problems in the way that we respond or distribute dollars in the future. Um, so I, I hope that answered the question, but yes, we have a comprehensive plan which is actually available online. Uh, it's called our Envision Longmont uh, Comp Plan. Uh, it has recovery components built into it, uh, or I should say uh, resiliency and, you know, flooding, you know, that kind of stuff built into it. So it's a really good document. It's very beautiful, too. Um, if you ever get a chance to take a look at it or use it as an example, um, it is out and available online. And, yeah, did I answer the question? Is there yeah. anything else I can ask on that one? Um, recovery Office, the kind of workflow slide you have with that image up of the PWs, if you could just kind of talk a little bit more about that and how – what other elements went into that? So this is one of those nerd points that I could ramble about for some time. But um, uh, one of the places that this began is that I had staff who were just, they just felt totally inundated with the level of detail. Like we've got invoices and work hours and labor hours and all these new systems that the, that the staff and city had never really interacted with. So um, what, we, what I ended up doing was realizing that I needed to find a way to um, not only show priority, uh, of a project, but also actually, this is really strange, but actually limit 
the um, what they were actually working on. So let's just walk through the, the workflow board here. So the queue on the left, um, and I should note there's some details you may not be able to see here. Um, the board is actually self-describing. Uh, I have written instructions into the board that are in light gray behind so that if anyone is walking by and they're like, what, what is this? What am I looking at? Um, they can actually read it and be like, oh, okay. Um, the in queue area is just what's coming down the pipe. So uh, this area is stuff that my team is not at all working on. We are not starting work on this, but we know that this is the next step. So what I did for our closeout phase was to chunk out um, projects that were going to be difficult to close out or easy to close out. So I kind of hybridized the lean process with agile, which my prior uh, career in life uh, ended up kind of focusing on, um, which is a little bit advanced for this particular group. Um, I used what were called sprints. So what I did was I packed certain PWs together that um, made sense to close out together because they either had proximity or they were a mix of difficulty level and closing out. So the queue is just projects that uh, were coming down the pipe uh, that would, you know, that would be next after we worked through all the active projects. Um, but what you'll see is in that blue section, it says backup priority, and I'm sorry you can't see this, but in the purple section, it's called normal priority. So that's projects that are just healthy, moving along. Um, and then the red section is the highest priority section. So what that means is either um, I, I felt like there's a project that's taking too long to get done, or we need to put a, a really fine-tooth comb on something because it's very difficult and needs to get closed out. Um, the highest priority section is where the team would start focusing on that project exclusively until we were broken through some uh, hurdle or roadblock that we were running through. Um, I'm sorry to bounce around a little bit, but going back to backup priority. Backup priority is projects that we would start what I call the phase zero item. So these are when we would make a request to a project manager like a month before the team would really start working on it. So what we calculated was um, the amount of time it was taking people to give us critical information that would allow us to continue moving forward. So that's something that you saw in the Trello board. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but you'll see there's phase zero, uh, colon, prepare to begin RFC. So yeah, I can see that. Is, yeah, so the backup priority links directly to that. So what we did was we, as we were starting to get through the majority of the work on the other PWs that we were working on closeout, um, we would start the phase zeros, which are very easy for us. We templatized the email that we would send out, and then we would address the project managers with, hey, can you provide us with a memo for what happened on this project? Um, tell us anything that includes these particular details and so on. So backup priority is just the simple, easy stuff. Normal priority means we are chugging along on this, uh, powering through. We're actively working on these as a team. The highest priority is stuff that we are um, hammering on. It is the top priority for our work sessions and so on. Um, walking through to the next step, there's a little red arrow that shows um, things moving to the hold section. So we would encounter things where um, either there would be a problem with the data, we needed an accountant to break through something, or there was a critical piece of documentation missing, um, or a project manager had made a normal, natural human error, and we needed them to correct it. So that would mean that we couldn't do any further work on that particular project. So I built in uh, the capacity for this workflow board to actually put things on what I call the human hold. So that was if we're waiting on someone for something that's holding us up from continuing. Um, or a tech hold. So if we were having some kind of technological issue that was preventing us from continuing workflow, we would drop that PW into those zones. What that allowed us to do was then to pick up something in backup priority or to start focusing on the other ones. So this one completely went off the team's table until that particular issue was resolved or completed. Um, the next section is final review. So this is where uh, we have the accountants do the final review of our project where I review the contents of the package to make sure that what we're providing FEMA with um, is kind of a one and done um, process. The best, this was the best that we could do. Um, there were times when I had to kick things back from the final review back into the highest priority zone so that the team could work through some detail that um, I found or that an accountant found. Um, there's another 
column that you can't see there is just called done. So that's when we have completely submitted something and a project is completely done, um, which is right now completely, it's so full that things are starting to fall off. I'm, I'm considering actually making a shoebox where I just put all these completed projects in, um, which is great. Uh, the very bottom, uh, I had staff that were really having a hard time figuring out, like, what are our priorities? I don't see the bigger picture and so on. So what I decided to do was integrate the bigger picture at the bottom as uh, as just a constant, like, this is what I think are our ongoing and main pri projects and priorities, so that they were always in the know about what we were doing um, and what were the top four priorities. So you may be able to see that there's a, a small section with like a little dotted line kind of going down after the first four sticky notes. Um, I just figured that there were four things that were like, these are the most critical things that we work on. If we had to drop everything else past that for a brief moment, if we needed to, the top four are the most important. So in this particular phase, we, our RFPs, which is request for close out, those just close out. Um, we were supporting project managers through their projects um, for a big period during the big push during our recovery. Um, there were project reconciliations, so that's like the financial reconciliations of the data before we really started going into the closeout procedure. Um, and then request for reimbursement. So this is how we got our cash flows up and running was by making this a central piece and point of our workflow. Um, and then I could go into the rest. but. Um, I really designed this to be all fairly self-explanatory. So I've actually had other teams in my um, within the city basically just take this thing verbatim um, because it's it's self-describing. I built it to be self-describing. Well, what were some other attributes that you might have in, included in here? Um, and was there anything that didn't that wasn't specifically related to PA work? Um, what other facets did you include in your workflow process overall? Oh, okay. Um, so in our GIS layer, some additional attributes included certain things that a project manager would want to know. So a, for instance, is like um, warranty periods, um, you know, uh, times where uh, a project manager should not disturb a particular piece of infrastructure because it would cause, you know, us to jeopardize funding that, you know, like let's say a project, we had used FEMA funding to install a, you know, a flow control structure or something like that. And let's say a project manager was going to tear it out because they needed to make this other change as part of this other project. All we did was build in all that information so that there were warnings that those existed. Um, not only warnings, but like kind of the whys and the, and the how did that end up getting there. Um, so we also report these layer attributes uh, when we hit a closeout. So we submit a form to our GIS department, which we also templatize, of course. Um, and what that does is allows us to give them the critical pieces of information they would put into the GIS as part of those layers. Um, but the layers are really that a FEMA project happened, what the pieces of infrastructure were, um, how many dollars were associated with that, um, when the project was completed, so when did the warranty period um, kick off, how much did it cost. Um, I mean, and then of course it includes the geolocation information. So. Uh, not only uh, just where it is on the ground, like the point data, but then it also includes kind of the shape uh, that someone would need to pay attention to. So you can really, we've basically tagged all of that infrastructure. Um, so I think I, without going into each of the different, the 17 pieces that I noted there, that was actually a detail from our GIS group. Um, I could probably actually send you that um, if you were super interested in the, in the nitty gritty level um, of information. We were actually integrating, um, assisting the project managers with administration of their paperwork on a regular basis. So we were creating a social structure in our organization where the grant administrators and accountants would get in the same room um, and help the project managers make good decisions, answer regular questions, address ideas. In fact. One of the one of the uh, long-standing meetings that I created, which you know, meetings a four-letter word in most places, which I totally understand. Um, but I designed a meeting that I called the, the flood re-railer, and what this does is it puts the grant administrators in the same room with the project managers, and we talk about project status, but we also talk about um, you know paperwork going through the system. How many change orders do you have? Do you have any oddities that are in the field? Stuff like that. 
Um, we've ended up treating it more lately as a more of an office hours because our current project managers working on the project are pretty much um, practice FEMA, reco FEMA recovery project rock stars. So we're basically there to um, help make sure that their workflows are matching our workflows and that there's um, a lot of communication between the the dirt movers, effectively, the accountants who are counting the beans, and the recovery group, which is maintaining eligibility, all the documentation, and catching all the stuff coming out of all these zones. So I think without getting too long-winded as to how I would integrate that, we've kind of integrated that by creating relationships and social structures within the city that contribute to positive outcomes. Uh, on FEMA projects by making sure that everyone is supported on this process and that communication is regularly going out regarding um, the hows, the whats, the whys on FEMA project administration. Um, what it's really ended up doing is um, greatly reducing, if not eliminating, frustration on part of our project managers with working on FEMA projects. There are, of course, some that will never really get over that level of complexity. They don't, they just don't like it, but that I don't, I'm not worried about those. I'm worried about helping people who are going to help make our community recover faster, better, stronger. Um, I wanted to ask you about morale. Uh, as we've heard from many communities, there's incredible high turnover. Uh, people are managing their own uh, losses as well as trying to figure out this frustrating world. So when I look back at our disaster recovery, the, the beginning wasn't as shiny and happy as it is now. Like, we're very well under control right now. We have a very good working relationship with our state and FEMA because we're now more, um, we're further along, first of all. But second of all, we've also gotten great clarity on how this stuff works, and we've made it kind of part of our workflow routine now. Um, but in the beginning, we had people working 80, 90 hours a week. They didn't necessarily have losses of their own, but because they were directors, you know, uh, it was their goal and their job to get uh, to get our community back up and running. I mean, our community was almost cut in half during the floods. Um, most of our recreational infrastructure, so our greenway paths, would have been wiped out. Um, and those are a major community feature. Like, this is Colorado. People love to get out and ride their bikes and go for walks and runs and so on. So um, so there was a lot of pressure to get that stuff back online. Um, we did end up losing a um, natural resources director um, because, it, you know, it was an intensely stressful job for a very long period. Um, I would not say that that was a result of FEMA, though. I think that's just the nature of being in a community that's not used to disaster. Um, and trying to put everything back together. Um, so for the morale piece, I think some of the biggest takeaways that I would say would be that municipalities who are going through a disaster for the first time, or even the second time, need to keep a very close eye on making sure that their directors know that they're, you know, doing a good job, that there is a, there is basically, I mean, there's kind of an obligation to not burn yourself out on a particular project. Um, I think a lot of city leadership uh, here would also say that it's really important to recognize when you do have signs of burnout, making sure that you find a way to, to gain relief for that individual. Um, you know, people in the debris removal world, the parks world, um, the city infrastructure pieces are going to be worn thin. They're going to be run ragged during these, during these events. Um, the other thing that I would say for morale is that cities who have not gone through this yet, um, if they were to get up to speed on the level of detail that they should be tracking, there's a new why that they should be paying attention to. And the why for them is all of this stuff has ended up making our city a better, a better working machine. We are more able to handle uh, amounts of data. We're more transparent than ever before. Um, we have the ability to answer questions for our, um, for our community a lot faster. And we're far more willing to adapt and move um, our disaster ended up uh, allowing me to kind of end up uh, carrying lean into our organization as a regular practice. Um, morale can be greatly boosted when you have the capacity to change on a regular basis and when you make positive change a regular part um, of your organizational culture. So I think if we had another disaster today, I think it would go very differently. Um, I would be spotting 
the project with Harold and, you know, helping him, for instance, watch for burnout. Because this is something that you can put in. If you, if you could avoid sleep altogether, you could put in 24 hours a day. And there comes a point where you'd still be behind in your work. So there needs to, you know, if you can find a way to communicate balance and to find balance among uh, or for staff sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's for staff. Um, I think most communities would be better off um, in the municipal sphere. I mean, there's also a challenge with this, and that is that municipal governments are in direct contact with their communities. Um, we're not a layer separated. We're not, you know, you know, Longmont's 40 miles north of Denver or so. Um, you know, we are embedded inside of the community, so there is definitely, you know, kind of a, a really heavy lift there for uh, the local organization. But I think the most important thing is to spot people, control expectations um, along the way, not only from the beginning, limit fear and chaos, um, and also just make sure that uh, the people who are doing this work are, are not only being celebrated, but that their successes are being celebrated, but that there's also a resource um, available to help them overcome some of the challenges. None of the people who are working on disaster in a municipal government are in, are intentionally adding chaos to their own work. It's due to a lack of knowledge or familiarity with what they're going through that would lend to that, that would lend to the, you know, kind of feverish burnout and so on. Um, so just kind of being realistic about what your lift is, who, you know, um, what your obligations to the community are, which are, you know, always very great. Um, well, I talked to the town of uh, or the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the other day, and one of the things that I wanted to communicate to them is that, you know, um, as soon as the sirens and what have you stop flashing, you know, the dream team for your community is the accountants, the financial officers, the city manager, and so on. Like, you are the greatest hope for a successful recovery. But I also communicated that, um, and this is really important, I think, to communicate in the beginning, and that is that. Um, Experiencing a disaster or helping with a disaster recovery will become a keystone in pretty much anyone's career. And pushing through it can be a very, very positive thing for the social relationships within an organization. Um, I think it brought our city staff and our city leadership even closer than ever before um, because they were basically, you know, arm in arm with each other through the entire thing. So communicating that there's actually also a, you know, kind of a greatness and a great reward coming out of something doing something that's difficult. That's intensive for a community um, is something that uh, I think I would advise people going through it the first time to know that there's intense value in what they're doing um, from the beginning. And yes, it's going to be very difficult, plan for it to be difficult, um, but also plan for it to be a keystone in your um, career future um, because it will, it will end up basically shaping everything you do from here on out um, as far as a professional will, will go. Um, but it'll also be the story that you tell everyone um, when they ask what you did and what your greatest moment was in your uh, organization. That's to help us get a community back on track. I want to, uh, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to share these insights, but, but more to thank you for, uh, for all the, your service. Uh, you really, I, I can see made a huge impact on uh, on Longmont. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I, I also want to reflect that to you guys. Um, I've heard some of the things that you're doing, um, and I'm always extremely impressed with the fact that FEMA just goes in to the storm every single time. Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, and I mean, on behalf of Longmont, we thank FEMA for everything they've done from the beginning and uh, for being there through the entire thing.